Hey, good evening. Wednesday night Bible study at North Baptist Church. We're excited that you are clicking on and getting connected with us. Uh, we appreciate you just kind of coming and joining in this evening. So uh, we ask that you um, make sure and everybody that clicks on, make sure you make them feel welcome. Say hello. Uh, Got to do our little bit of fellowship time here in the very beginning. So um, you can start with that. Uh, be sure and share this on your page as well when uh, you get going here, and that will help uh, others to see and to be able to be a part of what uh, we're doing this evening. Facebook Live, North Baptist Church. And so, again, this evening, I, I want to encourage you to share this on your page. I would like for you to, um, if people click on and, and start being a part, be sure and tell them hello, be sure and tell them hi. Uh, we see, um, I can see this evening that uh, Teresa Griffin, uh, Cor Kennard, Wendy, Tim Wendy, uh, Joe Brandle, um, John Prothro, uh, there, there Joe's got it. Hello, everybody. Uh, there's Devin. Tell Devin we said hi. Hi, Devin. And so everybody just... Be sure and tell everybody, you know, this is our time of fellowship where we're missing out on a lot. And I know um, one of the biggest things that everybody has said was that they've enjoyed the Facebook Live, but they really do miss, you know, meeting together. And so uh, we're still just in the process of it. So uh, that is that is okay. Uh, this evening, I got a couple of announcements as we get going. Uh, I really like you to think about and pray about uh, the Pomona Food Pantry will be tomorrow from 1 to 4. We've got some exciting news for that. We have uh, Life Care here in Ottawa is going to come out, and they're going to distribute uh, diapers and formula and baby wipes uh, to those mothers in need tomorrow at the Lighthouse. So uh, they'll be there from 1 to 4. So that, that's great news for us and great news for them and uh, great news for the families there in the Pomona area. So we um, got that on the screen there. And uh, Really, if you know somebody out there, be sure to mention that to them. Uh, if they're in need of some uh, uh, children things, uh, you know, the diapers, the wipes, the, uh, the baby formula, to be sure and stop by and see the, uh, the gals from Life Care there tomorrow, uh, 1 to 4 at the White House. And so with that this evening, I think we're ready for, could we be ready for special music, Jessica? Yeah. I think we're going to have some special music. How about that? If I surveyed all the good things that come to me from above, if I could count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for a favor of him beyond mortal king, and I'm sure that Yeah. 
She did a really good job. I really appreciated that. So, so thanks, Joe. I, I do really appreciate you uh, uh, bringing special music for us this evening. Uh, I know it's a little difficult for everybody, but uh, it's great the way we're able to uh, acclimate it into our service uh, at this time. And so, uh, super thanks for that, uh, Joe and, and Donna. So, this evening we're going to talk about so that you may believe, and we're going to be in John chapter twenty. Uh, actually, in Sunday morning, we were in John chapter 20, 30, and 31, and we're going to back up and kind of uh, revisit some of those scriptures this morning, and so I hope you, or this evening, from Sunday morning, um, so I hope you have your Bible this evening, I hope you have a pencil or pen that you can write with, I hope you have um, your copy, I hope you're able to watch this on the biggest screen that you have possible, whether it's your iPhone or a tablet, or you can plug it into your TV, however that works, and again, this evening, a uh, uh, I, I encourage you to share this uh, up on your page, and then be sure and uh, tell everybody that's on here hello. Uh, even if you don't know them, this is a great way to get to uh, to know one another. So uh, uh, visit as we get going. Uh, we're going to open in prayer uh, this evening, and uh, thank God for this opportunity we have to come together and for His Word and for His Son, Jesus Christ, and, and just what uh, things that we do have uh, within our our list of things. Uh, upon our prayer list, um, um, I'm trying to think several, I, a couple I was going to mention, but uh, um, uh, one is, uh, most of you know that uh, uh, Katie, Martin, and Trevor were in the hospital. They were able to come home today, so that was a real praise God. Uh, so uh, I'll be with them, uh, I'll be with, uh, with Devin as he, he's working, but uh, um, in the process of that, just continue to be with Trevor and, and help him to, to grow. Uh, we've had several others that come across our prayer list, and, and you know what those are at Norris, so uh, we encourage you to pray for those. Uh, continue to pray for the president, the vice president, our elected officials on the national level, uh, our state level, uh, our local level. And again, this isn't about whether you uh, truly agree with what's going on or who does what, but just that God would use each one of them at this time, and he would draw them to him. And in the process of drawing him, that they'd be able to make uh, positive uh, positive decisions uh, in uh, in this ruling for us. You know, we're in this uh, stay-at-home order. Some are starting to uh, get out of that. Uh, you know, Kansas is going to look into that and see what that means for us. And so, uh, we just pray that uh, God's hand is in the midst of that as well. Uh, but you know, as we began, uh, you know, 30 days ago, whatever it was, uh, it was really a great time for you to start a new habit of uh, reading your Bible, being involved with. Uh, uh, Bible study like this on Wednesday night, uh, doing some different things, and so I pray that <clears throat> this 30 days has been uh, less frustrating, as you can call it, and more productive uh, for you. Uh, it's been pretty productive for us in the way we uh, do things and do things differently, uh, so I hope that's for you as well. Uh, pray for the missionaries around the world that are, are still on the field. We pray for those that were able to come back before this took place, and and just that God would just orchestrate all that through there for all of them as well. Uh, we also pray for uh, all those that have been affected by this pandemic. And, and maybe uh, you might not know somebody personally, but um, uh, a lot of people do. You know, a lot of people have had loved ones that have, that have passed during this time. And it's been very difficult for them to, to be a part of that and to not really be able to be with them and to not be able to uh, uh, really understand truly what's going on as well. So really... Uh, we just ask God's comfort for each one of those, uh, for those that continue to have it. I know here in Kansas the numbers continue to, to rise, and so people are affected with it. And so we just ask that God would uh, work in their lives as well. And then for our own hearts and our own minds, that we would be in tune with what God wants us to be. Uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'll say this, uh, you might not agree with me, but I'm kind of thankful that all the distractions are out of the way, you know, all the 
all the sports and all the different things because he just enables me to focus a little more on, on what the Lord is doing and, and so uh, I've looked at this in such a positive measure in that way so I, I hope you're able to as well and so with that this evening would you, would you join me in prayer Lord you know we thank you this evening for uh, just an opportunity of uh, being able to gather together and we thank you for this technology and and Lord, I know still some really uh, get frustrated with it because where they're at, it might break up or, you know, be spotty at best or whatever it might be. But I just pray that you would allow this transition this evening, this live stream, to be able to go through to the hearts and the minds of those that you have truly uh, called for this time. Uh, we have a, uh, a real purpose uh, in life, and that purpose is to be uh, a, a, a spokesman for you in this world in which we live. And, and Father, I know uh, even people that are watching this, um, they don't just all live in Ottawa. Uh, they live uh, in surrounding areas, surrounding states. And Father, part of our uh, great thing that we call America. And Father, you've called us all to a, a closer relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. And I just pray that through these times that we've had to be able to share together that, that you're able to utilize that. You're able to draw them to you. And Father, they see the need of a, a true important relationship with you and and what that could mean in the world today, not only for them, but those they come in contact with as well. And so, Father, we lift those up to you this evening. We lift our elected officials up. You know, I know right here in Franklin County, they're scrambling to try to figure out what is the next step, what is the next move for for them as our leaders and for us as the, the people underneath them. And so, Father, we just pray that you would give them wisdom and uh, a real discernment at this time to make the right decisions that are, that are viable for each one. And and Father, we pray for our missionaries, uh, those that have uh, returned home uh, during this pandemic and those that are still out on the field. And Father, we pray around the world for those places that uh, may not have the medical uh, help, the medical uh, knowledge that uh, will guide them through a time like this. And so we just truly pray for that position as well. And again, Father, I pray for every heart and mind and soul that listens to this, whether it's live tonight or on the, on the webpage in the weeks to come or or off of somebody else's page, even this evening, uh, Lord, that you would just draw them to you, and Father, that you would utilize this time that we have together, and uh, it would be one that really brings fruit and glory and honor to you. And so we give you praise for this evening. We thank you for your written word that we have in the form of the Bible uh, that's true and uh, relevant for us today, and we thank you for the living word that we have in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ, that truly provided a way for each one of us uh, to be reconciled back to you. And so we give you the praise for that this evening. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you have a Bible this evening, I encourage you to open that up to John chapter 20. Uh, that's where we're going to be this evening. And we're going to start off uh, really way back at the beginning, just uh, right at the beginning there. And then uh, we're going to kind of move uh, rapidly through. And we're going to kind of look at a couple different individuals and, and their choices, their thoughts, their process, and what it means for them, because that's relevant for us today. And I've told you, you know, multiple times, whether it's at the churches that I've uh, ministered at or whether, you know, through this Facebook Live, that, that as we read these scriptures and we come across these different individuals that are in there, the important thing is to put yourself right in that place to see how God responded to them in their time of need and then say how that can actually take place in your life today. Uh, because the Bible is real and active. Uh, it wasn't just a thing that was done some two, four, six thousand years ago. It's something that, that's today. And it's something that we can use. It's something that we need. And it's what uh, our communities need, only they're at the point where they don't understand that. And so uh, they need to see it lived out in us, and that's what will make a difference. So the main idea of our scripture this evening is that uh, uh, Jesus' resurrection uh, calls us to faith in him as the Messiah as the Son of God. And so what we're going to look at this evening is what leads a person to say, uh, I believe in Jesus Christ. And really not only to say that statement that I believe in Jesus Christ, but what does it mean to live that? What does it mean to live that you believe in Jesus Christ? And so that's what we're going to look at this evening. And so um, for people to... Uh, who believe only when they see things, you know, like, um, you know, the, the chair you're sitting in or the car you're in or the workplace you're at, you believe in that because you see it 
Uh, you can touch it. You can feel it. Uh, so you know that it's there. And so we're looking at Jesus' miracles in a way that offer the blessing of uh, others seeing it, which allows us then to be able to believe it. And as Mary Magdalene and, and Thomas are the ones that we're really going to look at this evening, this evening and so as, they, as they've come to believe Jesus, and it was because they came into an encounter with a, a risen Lord, that his name is Jesus Christ. And so when sometimes, uh, you know, we say that, that seeing is believing, and in God's way of doing things, it's really kind of backwards because believing allows us to see. And one scripture I don't have for this evening, but it, it is kind of common and really core for us at North Baptist this year, is John chapter 20, verse 20. And that verse says that uh, in the midst of as they saw Jesus, uh, it made a difference in their life. It made a difference. And so we need to get to the point of seeing Jesus work in our world and then enabling that to transform our lives to the position where God wants us to be. And so God does provide some help in leading us to believe. And he leads us to believe that even though we might not fully see what's happening, we trust God that, that he knows. And so to this point in the Gospel of John, uh, he's provided six signs uh, to enable us to see that, that he uh, is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and, and John calls these signs uh, miracles. Uh, he refers back and forth to those. And the last sign we see is the one that Jesus said multiple times through his scripture, that he said when Jesus died, he would rise again. And he would rise again so that people would believe. And so that's where we are today, some 2,000 years later, looking at the scripture saying, if Jesus really rose from the dead, what does it mean for us today? And so uh, at the time where Jesus was on the cross, there were many that had, had uh, walked right by the cross. Uh, many had uh, hurled insults at him. You know, if you're really the son of God, come down from the cross. You know, you can... Come down, you can save all these other people, but you can't save yourself. And so there were several of those that had said that. And then there was even some of his followers that were there at the cross. We see that through the scriptures. But then there were only a few of those who came to the tomb. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, a few faithful women, and really probably two apostles, Peter and John. Now today, over the years, thousands of people have uh, uh, have gone to Jerusalem to see an empty tomb. Uh, and even though it cannot be identified with certainty, they call it the tomb of where uh, Jesus was laid. And so it's really the, uh, the highlight of uh, people's visit to that area. Uh, for most tourists, that's a place that they want to go and see and, and be a part of more than anything else. And so in John's account here of this resurrection, we see real people. Okay, These are not made up people. These are real people that John then wrote about in his gospel that gives us the good news today. And first we see Mary Magdalene, who, who desperately sought after Jesus after his death. And she was the first one to see him alive. And then second, we're going to see the disciples who, who were, um, they encountered the resurrected Jesus. And all of them were there except for Thomas. And Thomas said he had to see to believe. Even though the other disciples had told him that Jesus was alive and that Jesus had resurrected, he had to see it for himself. And so we're going to start this evening with John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And so women uh, were the last of Jesus' followers at the cross. And they were the first ones then to the tomb the next morning. And so early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene discovered the empty tomb. And the scripture says that um, early on the first day of the week, 
While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And so obviously we see that Mary went looking for a dead Jesus. That was the last thing that she saw was the day before, was him, or on the time there, that he was placed in that tomb. The stone was rolled in front of him. And so Mary comes and she discovers this empty tomb. And so she ran to inform the disciples that, that had followed behind that, that the tomb was empty. And she didn't know where they, they placed Jesus' body. So Peter and John, they raised to the tomb. But Mary couldn't leave. Peter and John came, they saw, they left. Mary was just still there. And it was her persistent love for Jesus that, that paid off, really. As Mary sat there, the disciples were gone. She looks into the tomb again. And this time, in verses 11 and 12 of John chapter 20, she sees two angels there. In verse 11, it says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white. Seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. So the first time she looked, the disciples looked, there was nothing there. And then now she looks, and what she sees but, but two angels. And so John reminds us in the scripture that, that Mary, uh, Peter, John, none of them really understood what Jesus meant when he talked about uh, resurrection. But see, Mary had come looking to see, at this point, uh, a dead Jesus. And when she didn't see the dead Jesus there where he was supposed to be, then she was really wondering, where did they take you? What, what had happened here? And so Mary didn't even understand either, like the disciples, what Jesus had said was that he would rise again. They expected it to be some day, but they didn't expect it to be this day. And so Mary was waiting. And so today, that's where we are. We're kind of like Mary. We're waiting on Jesus. We're waiting on him to come again. You know, I've been to the graveyard recently. I had a brother that passed away just recently. And it was a cold day in Kansas, and we had snow. We had cold weather. And as you come to that point in, in time, you, you reflect, and it, it makes you think. And, and as I walked in that cemetery, it took me to the time really recently where we'd been at the cemetery where my mother and a lot of our relatives are, are buried. And as you walk through there, it was really amazing because I thought the bodies are here but they're not and I was encouraged because I knew my mother loved the Lord and I knew that when she passed away all of her ailments and all the problems she had with her health were, were gone and she had to, she didn't have to deal with that anymore and she was then in the presence of Jesus whom she loved and that she's waiting then for the rest of us to, to join her there and so the body was not, might have, the bone structure might have been there, but my mother, who I knew, she was not there because she was with him. And so they weren't quite understanding all this that had went on. And so, so that's where they were. They were confused. They, this Jesus that they loved, they, they wanted to go see his body basically one last time. And when they got there, he was gone. 
And so the Gospel of John represents, um, for many, the place where they first fell in love with Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we see that uh, most people, that's where they learn about God's love. right? For God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so believers and non-believers alike recognize the unique portrait that John paints of Jesus Christ. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their Gospels are, are really interesting. They really have a great pattern of producing individual stories about Jesus, but, but John's is the one that puts so much emphasis on some different things that really brings things to light for us. And so there they were. Suddenly, <clears throat> Mary is looking in. What she sees is two angels. She just looked in there and nothing was in there. And now she sees two angels and she was wanting to see Jesus. And it was incredible. Like the Jews of Jesus' day who had waited for the Messiah, they missed him as well. The disciples, Peter and John, had ran to the tomb to see exactly what Mary said. They had taken the body, they thought. And so when they get there, they see, they go in. <clears throat> There's nothing there. They leave. They miss the fact of what Jesus said, was that he would, in three days, he would rise again. <clears throat> Mary mistook the, the Lord for a, for a gardener. And she even asked the gardener, who she thought, where had they laid Jesus' body. Where where they placed it. And you, you don't really expect to see the living when you go to the graveyard looking for one who is deceased. And so we really can't fault Mary or you can't fault Peter or John. But that's exactly what Jesus had said. So was Mary's vision of going into that tomb and seeing it empty, was it blurred by the thought that Jesus was dead instead of Jesus is alive? And so whatever it was, the, whatever the case was, uh, Mary heard when she asked the gardener where he had, he had placed the body. And she heard that voice. She knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was Jesus' voice. She was astonished. She was amazed. She was awestruck because it's, it's him. And so at that point, we come to verse 17 in the scripture. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them... I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now think about that. She was looking for Jesus. The tomb was empty. She looked again. There's two angels in there. She comes in contact with who she thinks is the gardener, and she says, you know, where have you placed his body? And then as the gardener speaks, it's not the gardener, but it's Jesus. And as he speaks, she recognizes his voice. And what does she do? But followed his feet and grabbed him and she was just hugging on him and he's like, whoa! Whoa. Don't hold on to me. I'm not returned to the Father. So why did he not want her to embrace him? Well, today we know it's not because of social distancing, right? It's not because we're supposed to be six feet apart. We can't hug. You know, that, that wasn't the reason that Jesus was doing it. The best explanation comes in the fact that we see with the rest of that verse. Not only did Mary need to recognize that Jesus was alive, but so did the disciples. And the disciples knowing took priority over Mary hugging. It's not that she didn't want, it's not that Jesus didn't want a hug. He wanted others to know that he is alive. 
And so Jesus kind of rebuked her not for touching him. It's not that he was untouchable, but rather for holding on when others needed to know. And see, that should be a reflective in our lives today. Are there others in our lives today that need to know that Jesus is alive? See, God called us for a purpose and a plan, and the purpose is right now for this place, and he's executed you to be right where you are in a relationship with him so that you can share that Jesus is alive with those you come in contact with. And you have a relationship with them far greater than, than I would. If I was to tell some of your friends that Jesus is alive, they'd just say, well, there's that crazy preacher anyway. But you have built friendships and you've built relationships with people. And that's what God uses to continue to share the good news and the gospel. So the end of that verse really demonstrates Jesus' compassion. It included Mary because he wanted Mary to share the good news that Jesus is alive. And it's not only his father, but it's by believing in him, it's her father as well. And so that's what we need to see. Now it's interesting that Jesus chose not to reveal himself to Peter and John first, but to Mary. And really, we can kind of, the Apostle Paul had wrote a letter to the church in Galatia, and in chapter 3, verse 28, it really gives us some insight to that very thing. And uh, I know we're in John, you don't have to turn there, but it's Galatians 3, 28, it'll be on the screen if you, can, if you can see that. But the scripture says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So it wasn't about that it was a woman that got to share first. It was about one who got to share with others. And so that's who we are today. And so to all who would question the idea that, that God loves both genders, male and female, and he loves them the same. And yes, there are two, male and female. Amen. And Mary's story provides a reminder that the power of Christ transcends all that. And it breaks down every barrier, whether it's Greek or Jew or, or, or slave or free or male or female. He's beyond that. And so Mary's love then poured out in, in jubilant report to the disciples. She spoke as one who had, she, or she didn't speak as one who'd been rebuked by Jesus. She spoke as one that had been blessed by Jesus. In verse 18, she said, uh, John chapter 20, verse 18, she said, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. Now she physically saw him. But we need to be in place in our lives where we have seen the Lord's work in our life and in our hands and in the things that we do and the things we're a part of so that we're excited about that. So that it resounds when we go and talk to others. That verse I said, it's not going to be on the screen right now, but the verse I told you earlier, that kind of a theme for our church this year is John 20, 20. And after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And so I challenged our church this year to be able to see Jesus in everything they do. And man, boom, um, three months into this, we're not in church no more. People are freaked out because they can't sit in their pew and have their same songs and do all the things same that, that they normally do. And what Jesus is saying is, is that that's not it. You're the church. We're to see Jesus in our lives and we're to communicate Jesus to those that we come in contact with. And that's exactly what Mary was to do. She was to share that. I have seen the Lord. So he who had been with her Lord now saw that, that Jesus had overcome death. He'd overcome the tomb. And in her obedience to, to love Jesus, he revealed himself to her, and now she was able to share that with the disciples. And soon the other disciples would be able to share their joy as well as they 
saw Jesus themselves. But not all of them was there. Thomas didn't see. And because he didn't see, he said that, that he wouldn't believe. Now, in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they describe uh, numerous times the different things that Jesus done, but, but the Gospel of John builds on, on seven specific signs of miracles that Jesus had done. And these signs consist of, of the wonderful message that Jesus uh, performed these things, and he did it on and for a purpose, each one of them. And they build an intensity from uh, the miracle at Canaan where he turned the water into wine all the way up to the final one of Jesus' resurrection. And he wanted his readers to believe and experience this abundant life not just in eternity, but, but today. And so, over the years, it's been, I'm sure you've heard multiple times, where you've heard people say, don't be a doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. And what does that mean? Well, it means that, that others have seen, and because he didn't see personally himself, then he wasn't going to believe. And so people say, you know, don't be like a doubting Thomas. Thomas gave us that expression even though he didn't mean to when he did. But even though others had seen, it wasn't real to him because he had not been a part of it and he had not seen. And so John's story tells us a, a different side of Thomas. And Thomas is really characterized by three scriptures that come out in the Gospel of John. And the first one is John chapter 11, verse 16. And that verse says, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Let us go, that we may die with him. And so, Thomas was resounding. He had truth. He had action. And, and, and if, if Jesus was going to die, he was going to die too. And so he was ready to go, whatever the purpose was. And so Thomas was going to be a part of that. And then the second thing is found in John chapter 14, verse 5. And in 14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, and this is where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And the first thing that Thomas says when he pops up, Thomas said, Lord, we do, don't know, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And so some of the statements and some of the questions that John has, is real, or that Thomas had, is really important for us today because it reveals a lot in our hearts and our minds today. You know, the kids are on a, on a distance learning thing now, and uh, none of them are in the classrooms. They're they're doing it on their Chromebooks at home, or maybe they're getting homework at home where they get handed out and they have to do it and turn it back in. And and so even my daughters in high school have said it's a little more difficult because when you're sitting in a class and you have a teacher teaching, even if you don't ask the question, someone else might. And as they ask that question, it reveals more about the subject to you than you knew before. And without being there, you miss that hands-on learning that takes place. Yeah, you might get the point of understanding 2 plus 2 is 4, but you don't understand where the 2 came from and what the other 2 came from and how it gets to the point of 4. And, and so that's what they were saying. And so we see that with Thomas. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? And so Jesus goes on to tell them that question that Thomas had asked and so so many of us ask as well Lord you may be going to heaven but we don't know the way how do we get there well she said I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me and in the last statement for Thomas is then found in John chapter 20 verse 28 and at that point Thomas said to him my Lord and my God and so Thomas comes from the point of, 
of wanting to die for Jesus, no matter what was going on, to then not even knowing where Jesus was going. He had to find out the way to the point now of finally saying, my Lord and my God. He's not just somebody else's Jesus. He's not just somebody else's Messiah. He's his. And so that's where it comes, and it needs to be in our lives as well. It can't just be somebody else's Jesus. It can't be somebody else's Messiah. He's got to come to the point in your life where he is your God and your Messiah. And so doubt was... Uh, uh, was a true destination for Thomas throughout his life there until that point in, in, in verse 28. And so, you know, do we doubt sometimes? Yeah, I, I know you do. I, I still do. Uh, I try to not think that I do, but I have those times in my life where I'm like, man, yeah, Lord, what are you doing? What's going on here? And, and how can this really help? Or how can this be a benefit? Uh, do you despair? Yeah, we're, we're sorrowful. We're hurt when we have loved ones gone away. Even if they went to be with the Lord, it, it's hard for us to understand. And so we don't quite have that on there, too. And so if we're honest, we really do doubt, just like Thomas, the destination of things to come. We don't know. Uh, and so we wonder because we don't know. Hey, have you ever taken a trip with your kids? First thing we want to know is, are we there yet? Right? I, I, no, we've not even left the driveway. We're not there. Well, they don't know where there is, so how do they know if we've got there? Have they reached the destination? And so, no, that isn't the case. And so Thomas is just now is, is coming into this time of a relationship with Jesus deeper than he's ever been. Even though he's walked with him all these years, even though he saw the miracles that Jesus performed, it wasn't until after Jesus' resurrection, it wasn't until after Jesus produced himself in the room where Thomas was that he finally believed. Did he have to place his hands uh, in, in Jesus' hands inside? No, at that point he believed, so he didn't need to. He thought he did, but when he came in contact with the risen Lord, he realized that he did not need to. And so Thomas made the greatest confession of faith in John's gospel uh, where he explained that he said, my Lord and my God. Uh, because of Thomas, we get to hear uh, the greatest uh, thing of all. So in verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And so it's important to us today, we don't have to see because we know there are ones that did. We have true and accurate witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, and we believe their truth, and so it becomes a belief in our lives because of what had taken place there. You know, years ago, I remember uh, I accepted Jesus when I was 10 years old. Uh, I was baptized. Uh, I didn't do a thing with it, though. Uh, I read a little scripture every now and then. I went to Sunday school. Uh, I went to youth group. I, you know, I did the church thing. And, and, uh, but I didn't really do anything to pursue a relationship with him. And it wasn't until really I, I, I knew all the songs. I had grown up in the church. I knew a lot of the scriptures. Uh, when the, I'd heard a lot of sermons. When the preacher would preach, I'd think, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. And a lot of times I would just tune out because I'd heard that before. And so I missed a lot of messages that the Lord was trying to speak to me with because I thought I had already heard it. I heard that before. And so there was a time in our life when Michelle and I were first married and we had uh, two or three young kids that, that our church was going through uh, the New Testament. Check this out. This will date you. On cassette. Y'all know what a cassette is, right? Yeah, my kids are like, what? Yeah, cassette. And we had this little folder thing full of cassettes. And so we started uh, listening to them. And so I started listening to it at Matthew 1. And so we had certain things that we would listen to every day. And it was dramatized. And it was a great uh, message. And I would follow along in my scripture. And so I would 
write down the dates of the times when I had, <coughs> excuse me, had listened to it, and and we started in Matthew one one, and we got through Matthew, and I, man, this is just great, and started in uh, Mark and got started in Mark one and finished in Mark, and that was great. Matthew, Mark, and got to Luke and got going through Luke, and, and that was great. And uh, uh, we're later on in the end of the year now that we're in John, and. So we're listening in John here at this point, and uh, come across John chapter 20, and Thomas said, I am not going to believe unless I can put my hands where uh, the scars are in his hands, unless I can touch the side where the spear you know, was injected into him. And, and so I thought, wow, that is just like amazing to think that. And and at that point in my life, I was thinking, I am almost kind of like Thomas. I kind of think that too. You know, if I could really see that, it would really make a difference in my life. And it wasn't just, it was the same night. It was just a few scriptures later that I remember uh, the uh, John opening up and he said that they were in the upper room and uh, Thomas was there this time. And at that point, Jesus appeared behind the locked doors and there was Thomas. And that's when Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And when that read, and I, I read that in my scriptures that night, it gives me goosebumps tonight and it was like a light bulb that clicked onto my head and it was like, you know what? I don't need to see because Thomas did. And I believe who Thomas is because John tells us exactly who he is. And because Thomas believes and he saw, I don't need to see to believe, but if I believe, it's going to make a difference in my life. And I'm telling you, it has. That was a lot of years ago, and I really feel like that was the first time that the Lord really revealed himself to me through the scriptures. And since then, I can tell you multiple times as I've read through the scriptures that I really feel like God just speaks audibly to me, and, and I, I know uh, he does it. You can't hear it in this room where my girls are if God was speaking to me. But, but through his word, he communicates through us. And so that is just so true. And so, so John said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And I know we would have loved to have been there to see that empty tomb. We would have loved to have been there and to see Jesus walking after his death and to hear him and to eat with him and to sit down and to break bread with him and to walk on the road with him and to then see him ascend and knowing he's coming again. But we have Thomases like that who were the privilege of being there and seeing it as an eyewitness that tell us today that it's true. And if we give ourselves to that opportunity, God promises us the joy of knowing Christ and being able to share with those that we come in contact with. It's real. And like Thomas, many of us don't want to believe because we can't see. And like I said, I was, I was there. I believed. I knew I needed a Savior. I knew I, I, I needed to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I knew I needed to be baptized. I knew those things, but I hadn't grown in my relationship with him. And at that point, it really began. And so Thomas said if he didn't see, he wouldn't believe. But when it comes to the point, he didn't even have to touch it because he knew it was real. And John was the one who was able to pin this down for us. And Thomas had made two mistakes. And the first was that he stayed away from the fellowship of believers. See, he had a chance to be with them that very first night, but Thomas chose not to be there. And because he chose not to be there, he missed so much. And I hope you hear what I'm saying. Because if that's you this evening that skipped out on some of those things because you've heard it before, or you may not need it tonight, or you've got multiple things to do, and what you're missing out on is the chance to see Jesus work in your own life. Fellowshipping with other believers, being a part of studying his word, 
is the way that we grow in our relationship with him. And so the way that John distinguished his gospel was by referring to those different signs, those miracles that he had. And these special miracles uh, respond to us. We have to respond by faith to believe those. Those miracles be began with a conversation uh, where the, or the conversion, I mean, of the, of the water to wine. The healing of the official son. Uh, continue the healing of the lame man the, at the pool of Bethesda. The feeding of the multitude. Giving sight to the blind. Raising Lazarus from the dead. And then finally, the, the John pictures the marvelous portrait of Jesus rising again. And so the story of Jesus' resurrection is the seventh sign. It's the perfect sign. And John explained the purpose of that as being inconclusive with the others, and they were written, now we close with this Sunday morning, John chapter 20, verse 31. <laughs> written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so if we don't gather together, if we don't come together, even if it's like this on, on live, where we follow through Bible study, if we don't, we miss it. And Jesus blessed that gathering and the time they had together. And then the second mistake Thomas made was that he demanded visible evidence. Thomas was a, a rational person. He said, you know, I need to see uh, proof. And if I see the proof, then, then I'll believe. And so he believed finally without having that. Remember he said in the beginning, let's go and die with him. Well, obviously that's not what he meant. That was a powerful thing to say, but there was no real meaning behind it. Because then he said, unless I see the, the, the nail scars in his hands and, the, and in his side, I'll not believe. But he did believe. And he believed in a real way. You know, there was a story about a, a, a Baptist and a, an atheist. And so the atheist come to the Baptist and he said, uh, do you believe in God? And the Baptist said, why, yes. And the, and the atheist said, well, have you ever seen God? And the Baptist said, well, no. The atheist said, have you ever touched God? And the Baptist said, well, no. And the atheist said, have you ever felt God? And the Baptist said, well, no. And so the atheist said, what makes you think there is a God? And so the Baptist looked at the atheist and he said, let me ask you three questions. He said, have you ever seen your brain? And the atheist said, no. The Baptist said, have you ever felt your brain? And the atheist said, no. The Baptist said, have you ever touched your brain? And the atheist said, no. And the Baptist said, then what makes you think you have one? Hmm. Powerful question, huh? Works back around that way. Skeptics attempt to justify their unbelief by saying that the disciples just wanted to believe so badly that they had admitted this. This resurrection wasn't even real. But we see these truths that come out in Scripture. <laughs> Jesus came to his disciples, his group, and then he came to Thomas personally and individually, and Jesus still comes to each one of us all the time. And when Jesus came to Thomas, he said, Thomas, here, here I am. And Thomas realized just by the word of God, just by Jesus' spoken word, and that's just the way that we understand who God is, is by those very things. When Adam and Eve sinned, God went looking for them. When the world was lost in sin, God came personally. When Jesus' disciples were afraid, he came to them. When one disciple missed the opportunity, 
to see Jesus, Jesus came back specifically for him. And so when Jesus came personally to Thomas, he gave Thomas the peace to say, as we found in John chapter 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. And so Mary Magdalene, she believed because she saw Jesus. So did the other disciples. Thomas hadn't had that chance because he wasn't there, but it was the chance that he could have had, only he chose not to. And so we have that same chance today. We may not see Jesus with our eyes, but we believe in him. And so the question is, will you believe in him? And so I I challenge you to read this story in in John chapter 20 again after we close this evening, or maybe tomorrow or the next day. And if you're honestly seeking Jesus, Jesus promises that you'll find him. And so it's not about crying over the lost chances that we've had or the mistakes that we've made through our lives or the disadvantage we've had because of uh, something that happened in our life. It's about what are we going to do with this opportunity that we have for faith today. And so as we close out this evening, I've got five things I want to talk to you about. And one is I want you to look at the signs that Jesus performed. And so we're going to have those this evening. The first one is from John chapter 2. And that was a sign of turning the water into wine. The second one is in John chapter 4, 46 to 54, healing the royal official's son. Number three is in chapter 5, 1 through 15, and that's healing the lame man. Number three. Number four is in chapter 6, 1 through 15, and that's feeding the 5,000. Number five, he heals the the blind man in John chapter 9. In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And here in John chapter 20, we see Jesus' resurrection. And I want you to see the progression of that. From turning the water into wine, he had control over creation into healing the royal official's son from not even being there. He healed him at a distance. He healed the lame man who had been lame from birth. He fed the 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and fish. He healed the man born blind. He raised Lazarus from the dead, proving that he does have power over death and the grave. And the ultimate was that was his own, in number seven there, when Jesus' resurrection, he had the power over sin and death and the grave and hell. And so has that belief changed your life? And see, that's what it needs to do is to make a difference. Not just to believe that Jesus rose again, but has it became personal to you? And so Mary grieved in the garden alone. Thomas struggled with his doubts by himself. And that's where the church community of faith comes in. When we have doubts, when we have disbelief, that's where the body of Christ is supposed to step up and to encourage and strengthen you. And so you're not supposed to pull away when you have those doubts, but you're supposed to gather in closer. And then what about those explanations of Jesus and Mary? In John chapter 20, verse 17, He said, don't hold on to me, for I have yet ascended to the Father. Go instead and tell my brothers, and tell them that I have ascended to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. And so I'd encourage you to pick one of those. What what do you like best about what Jesus told Mary in there? Because you can mark out Mary's name and place your name right there. Don't doubt. And in Thomas's confession of faith in John chapter 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God, is that where we are? And so to conclude it again this evening, we see John chapter 20, verse 31, thinking about the gospel and what it means. 
And that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so that's what it means and needs to be for you, is that it has to be personal. And it's not just about accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's not just about being baptized, even though those things are super important in your life. It's about growing in your relationship with him. And so with that this evening, would you, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you this evening that you've opened up the Gospel of John to each one of us, and I pray that you would strengthen us in the midst of that. Father, I pray that you would encourage us to do and to believe in such a way that it makes a difference not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. Father, I pray this message goes just far beyond what I could ever say, that your Holy Spirit would minister to the hearts and lives of all those that it comes in contact with, and that, Father, that you would truly uh, just be the one who receives the glory and honor. And so for that, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And again, thing, as we think about that, you know, what does John want you to believe from the reading of the Gospel of John, from John chapter 20? There's a lot, and you heard those things this evening. And should believing in Jesus make a difference in your life? The resounding answer to that is yes. Not the way you were before, but the way God wants you to be. And it's a process, and he's the one that does the transformation. We don't. We don't change. He changes us from within. But he only does that to willing, obedient vessels. And so will you be that willing, obedient vessel? So this evening we have another special music. Uh, Rob Callahan is going to uh, close us out this evening with a song that he's recorded for us. And so if we can go ahead and play that. to uh, record some songs. I didn't tell them what to sing. I didn't tell them what to do. And it's been so unique how these songs have worked together so well. Uh, we're so blessed by <laughs> uh, each one of them listening to the Lord's uh, voice and, and responding to the song that needed to be sung. And so we've had those over the last several Sundays. Uh, you, you can just see how those go together. Hopefully, you know, you've been able to see those that you're watching. You can see Jesus in them. That's what we're looking for, remember? John 20, 20. And so as we close out this evening, we see it again with Rob giving us amazing grace. 
And so that's what it is in our lives. We have the grace that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. We have true witnesses that were there. We might have not been there. We might doubt like Thomas, but we trust that Thomas is an eyewitness to see what he did and how it made a difference in his life. And so we pray that that makes a difference in yours as well. As we close out this evening again, we've had people ask about how they can donate to this ministry and how can they help in this time of, of need with the, uh, with the not being at the church building and the facilities anymore. And <clears throat> you can go on the North Baptist Church um, on the Facebook page. You can download an app that will be able to give uh, directly, securely to North Baptist. It's, it's safe. It's, it's online. You can even track your own giving through that. Uh, you can go to our uh, webpage, Ottawa uh, nbc.org and that'll tell you how to uh, do the same thing or you can mail a check you know, some people call it what snail mail and you can mail a check uh, to post office box 117 Ottawa Kansas 66067 attention Linda and it'll get right there and wherever you designate that money to go if you want it to go youth or you want it to go to the general funds or whatever uh, it'll go right to wherever you place that and so we encourage you to do that this evening. Now we're going to close off here in a minute. And uh, uh, you're not going to be able to go directly to tell those people hi and bye. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds here to, to fellowship again. Get together and tell them, hey, we're so thankful that you fellowshiped with us. Uh, I love the fact that you joined us this evening. Uh, you could have been anywhere else and you're right here with us. And so we are blessed uh, by it. And I hope that you are blessed as well. I am so thankful for you. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what I was going to say with these songs were so important that we had one last week that um, I believe it was one that Rob had sung last week uh, for Cora was a very special song. And so uh, it, it's really unique how God placed those in there without us even knowing it. And so hopefully these songs this evening also ministered to you as well as the scripture. So we're very thankful you joined us uh, again. Uh, we hope to see you Sunday morning at 1030 live at North Baptist Church. We'll be right here looking to get a hold of you. If you need something in the meantime, uh, message me. Uh, if you're from around here, call me, get a hold of me, whatever you need, and we'll be sure to uh, try to help answer your questions or get you headed in the right direction. Uh, don't forget tomorrow, 1 to 4, at the Lighthouse in Pomona, uh, the food pantry for the West Franklin School District. And the great thing is we have live care tomorrow coming to bring uh, diverse formula and wipes. Uh, so all those families that need that, we encourage you to, to be there as well. So great to have you. We love you. We'll see you on Sunday, 10.30 a.m. live.